welcome back once again to the imaginary gallery it is tj your host we are still looking at lundy bancroft's book why does he do that inside the minds of angry and controlling men and as a viewer has mentioned women it seems these books are all written to bash men, but men are not the only ones who are abusive. But I suppose if they're looking for mainstream acceptance, they're going to focus on men versus everybody. But that's a different subject and a different video entirely. We've moved on to chapter three, which is called the abusive mentality. The chapter starts out with some quotes, which I will paraphrase. It always seems that he's saying without saying to me, you owe me. He seems to twist everything around so that it's my fault. Sometimes I really feel suffocated by this person. It's trying to ruin my life. Everybody else seems to think he's the greatest person in the world. I wish they could see the side of this monster that I have to deal with. He tells me all the time he loves me. So why does he do this horrible stuff? These are common questions that occur to those who are involved in abusive relationships. But it doesn't look like abusive relationships, especially when it began with love bombing. Anything and everything you do is perfect and right. Doesn't matter what you say, what viewpoint you have, even if you're not even sure about it, the Cluster B toxic monster is going to be on your side. So even if you say, I think this, but I don't really know if it's right because it's uncomfortable, they're going to, oh yes, that's perfectly right. But all that changes when your concerns revolve around what kind of monster you've gotten yourself involved with. Then you're totally on your own. Chronic mistreatment gets us to doubt ourselves. If we were a child of like an abusive family or parents, we many times will know that something's wrong, but we just imagine it must be something wrong with us. We don't think that it could possibly be parents or someone else who's responsible for this problem. If we work for an abusive boss, Many times we might just think we're just not doing a good job, that we should be better and smarter and work harder. Males who are getting bullied think that maybe they should just be a little bit stronger or a little bit less afraid to fight back. Now when our author works with abused ladies, one of his first goals is to help her to regain trust in herself. He tries to get her to rely upon her own perceptions and to listen to those voices inside. He tells us that you don't really need any kind of expert on abuse to explain your own life to you. What you do need, above all, is some support and encouragement to hold on to your own truth. Now, the abusive partner wants to deny your experience. He wants to take away your individual view of reality, and he wants to replace it with his own. Now, what happens is when somebody invades your reality and identity in this way enough times, you'll naturally begin to lose your sense of balance. But our author is telling you there's hope, because you can find your way back to the center. Now, an abusive person, whether it be male or female, they create a lot of misconceptions to get the partner to doubt him or herself and to make it possible for the creature to lead the other one down a dead end or a series of dead end paths. Once you dispel these myths, you can then zero in on the roots of his steam rolling style. And the author believes that you will recognize them. The insights he's about to share have been taught to him primarily by the abused ladies themselves, who are the experts on abuse. His other teachers have been his abusive clients, who lead us towards clarity each time they 
accidentally lose their mask, which reveals their true thinking. So we'll go through some realities. Reality number one, she or he is controlling. He talks about his client, Glenn, who arrived angry and agitated for a group session one particular evening. His words were, Harriet started yelling at me, at me on Friday afternoon and told me she's going to move out of my house soon. Then she disappeared for the entire weekend and took my 10-year-old son with her. That really hurt me. So I decided to hurt her. So I wanted to go after something that was really important to her, show her what it was like. She had been working really hard on this college paper that she had to hand in on Monday. She left it sitting on top of her dresser. She's asking for it. So I ripped it to shreds. Then I tore up a bunch of photographs of the three of us. I left it all in a nice pile on the bed for this witch to come home to. I think she learned something from that. Now the author tells us that Glenn was remarkably honest with him about the thought process involved here and the motives, probably because he felt justified. Glenn expected for his word to be the last word. He did not accept defiance. He considered it his right to punish Harriet in the most horrifying way he could think of if she took steps to recover ownership of her life. He proudly spoke about how he had allowed her various freedoms when they were still together as if he were the mommy or the daddy and defended his right to remove her privileges when he thought the time had come. Control is what we're talking about here. As I've mentioned in other videos, there are many different types of control. Control isn't simply what we sometimes think of, which is basically overt control. Like if somebody says, you do this or you're not going to get that. Well, that's kind of obvious control, but there are many other ways of control. And our author states that a few of his clients have been so extremely controlling that they could have been mistaken for military commanders. Russell, for example, went so far as to require his kids to do calisthenics each morning before they went to school. The wife was not allowed to speak to anybody without his permission, and he would order her back to her room to change clothes if, by chance, he did not approve of her outfit. At the dinner time, he would sit back and make comments like a restaurant reviewer might about the strengths and weaknesses of the meal she had prepared. Periodically instruct her to go back to the kitchen as if she were a waitress. Russell's style was at one end of the spectrum of controlling behavior. Many clients that this author has seen stake out specific turfs to control. Like explorer might claim a specific piece of land rather than trying to run every single thing. One abusive person may be fanatical about having to win every single argument but leave the partner alone about what she wears. Another may permit the partner to argue about the children, for example, but if she does not let him change the television station when he wants to, look out! He states in parentheses that dozens of his clients have thrown or smashed remote controls. The television is tightly controlled by many abusers. Yes, it is. One abusive person will have a curfew for the partner, while another will allow the partner to come and go as it pleases, as long as it makes the meals and does the laundry. Isn't that beautiful? Next, our author talks about what he calls the spheres of control. He states that an abusive person's control generally falls into one or more of the following central spheres. Arguments and decision making. Now, an intimate relationship involves a steady flow of decisions to be made, conflicting needs to be negotiated, tastes and desires that need to be balanced. 
Who's going to clean up that nasty mess in the kitchen? How much time should we be alone? And how much time should we spend with others? Where do our other hobbies and interests fit into the priorities we have as a couple? How will we process and resolve any types of annoyances or feelings that get hurt? What are the rules we're going to set for our kids? The mindset that an abusive person brings to these choices can make him or her impassable to get along with. Imagine how challenging it is to negotiate or compromise with a person who operates on the following tenets, whether or not they are spoken aloud or just implied. Number one. An argument should only last as long as my patience. Once I've had it, discussion's finished. Shut your mouth. Number two. If the problem we're struggling about is important to me, I should get whatever it is that I want. If you don't back off, well then you are wronging me. Number three. I know what's best for you and for our relationship. If you continue to dis- telling you, after I've made it clear, well then you're just being stupid. Number four. If my control and authority seem to be slipping, I have the right to take the necessary steps to re-establish the rule of my will, including smacking you in the face if necessary. The last item on this list is the one that most distinguishes the abusive person from others. Any of us can slip into having feelings like the ones in 1, 2, and 3. But the abusive person gives him or herself permission to take action on the basis of these beliefs. With this type of person, the foregoing statements, they're not feelings. They are closely held convictions that he uses to guide his actions. That's why they lead to so much bullying behavior. Personal freedom. An abusive person many times considers it his or her right to control where the partner goes, with whom he or she associates, what clothing is worn, and when it needs to be back home. This abusive person therefore feels that the partner should be grateful for any freedom that it does choose to grant her or him and will say something in a counseling session like, My partner's all bent out of shape because there's one nasty girl I don't let her hang out with, when all the rest of the time I let her be friends with whoever she wants to be friends with. In this case, he expects the partner to give a medal of generosity, not to criticize him for any type of oppressiveness, because this abusive person sees itself as a reasonably permissive parent towards its adult partner, and it doesn't want to meet with a lot of resistance on the occasions when he believes that he needs to put a foot down. Now, sometimes the control is exercised through wearing the partner down with constant low-level complaints, rather than through screaming or barking out orders. The abusive person may repeatedly make derogatory comments about one of the partner's friends. For example, an effort to control her into not associating with that particular friend. Hopefully she gradually stops seeing that acquaintance to prevent another hassle or argument. In fact, she might even believe it was her own decision, not noticing how the abusive partner pressured her into it. Is the abusive person's thinking distorted? Certainly. The abuser's partner is not its child, and the freedoms it grants to the partner are not credits to be spent, like casino chips, when the urge to control her or him arises. But the rules of this abuser seem to make sense to him, if he's the abuser, and he will fight to hang on to them. Next, parenting. If this couple in question has kids, the abusive one typically considers itself to be the authority on parenting, even if it contributes very little to the actual work into looking after them. It sees itself 
as a wise and benevolent head coach who observes passively from the sideline during the easy time, but steps in with the correct approach when the partner isn't handling the children correctly. It's arrogance about the superiority of its parenting judgment may be matched only by how little it truly understands or pays attention to the kid's needs. No matter how good a mother the partner is, he thinks she needs to learn from him, not the other way around. And we're talking about men, women, whatever, just, it gets confusing. The abusive man or woman claims that the control is in the partner's best interests. The justification was captured by one of our author's clients named Vinny. Olga and I were driving in a really horrible neighborhood. We were arguing, and she became crazy the way she does and started to try to get out of the car. It was dark outside. This was the kind of place where anything could be happening to her. I said, stay in the car, that she wasn't getting out in a place like this. But she just kept trying to get out of the car to push the door open. I couldn't get her to stop. Finally, I had to smash her in the arm. And unfortunately, she hit her head against the window. But at least that got her to settle down and stay in the car. Now, does this Vinny person really believe he's abusing his partner for her own good? Yes and no. To some extent he does because he's convinced himself. But his real motivation is plain to see. Olga wanted out of the car in order to escape his control. And he wanted to make sure that she could not do so. Unfortunately, an abusive person can sometimes succeed in convincing others that the partner is so irrational and out of control that her judgment is so poor she needs to be saved from herself by him. Never believe a man's claim that he has to harm his partner in order to protect her or him. Only abusive people think this way. When a man starts this guy's program, he many times will say that I'm only here because I lose control of myself sometimes. I just need to get a better grip. It's that you take control of your partner. In order to change this, you don't need to gain control over yourself. You need to let go of control of your partner. And as we stated before in a previous video, the author will correct him and say no. Your problem is not that you lose control of yourself. A large part of his abusiveness comes in the form of punishment used to retaliate against you for resisting his control. This is one of the single most important concepts to grasp about the abusive person. Ah, and the narco -pack. I'm here giving more confessions. Imagine that. I'm getting tired of these goddamn confessions. I think I'm going to get out soon if I do just enough. And I'm running out of nice stories for you, so... TJ wants me doing this stuff? Well, he's going to have to take what he can get. And this is dedicated to you. You know who you are out there. I was supposed to be your best friend. <laughs> you remember me, don't you? I was a blonde back then. I used to come to your family's house for dinner. I purposefully made sure that your mother got sick. Remember how she went away to the hospital? <laughs> I made sure she'd be incapacitated for the longest time. You thought I was a sweet and innocent little naive thing, but little do you know, whenever we were together and you thought I was in the restroom, I was going through every drawer, every nook and cranny of your parents' bedroom, and I found that your father had a fortune, and I knew you had nothing, please. I just heard you had a rich father, so I hung out with you. <laughs> I had to get rid of that witch wife of his. You'll remember that time I came to dinner after we'd gone swimming and <laughs> remember how my boob accidentally plopped out of my swimsuit? Well, honey, 
That was no wardrobe malfunction if you're nasty, Janet. That was a purposeful fake wardrobe malfunction for your dad's benefit. Because I went to his thing when you were asleep one night. I saw he had all kinds of playboys. I noticed that his favorite models, evidently because he had some plastered inside of his suitcase, looked a lot like me. And the first time I saw those, <laughs> I started dressing up a little bit more like those photos. So when I knew your mother was about to go away sick, I made sure that my breast accidentally plopped out right in front of him at the dinner table. And it worked! <laughs> I couldn't show my face there afterwards when your mother came back, but <laughs> I got your father where I wanted them, and I didn't want you to know because I didn't want to hurt our friendship. I hope you understand. Oh, he was in love with me. I was just his child. You wouldn't understand. 